Therefore, I think they deserve some attention um, and haven't been given any. And also, they present some um, interesting strategic dilemmas uh, to think about. Um, just to introduce myself briefly before I do that, um, I'm Rafi. I am a recovering debating addict. Um, so I've been uh, debating for five or six years now. Um, so I think I've been to about 50 or 60 competitions. Um, so I've wasted, shall we say, my entire childhood uh, at various debating competitions. Um, and I was at one yesterday, I was at one the weekend before last, and I was at the week one the weekend um, before that. Um, so whilst I don't know about many things, uh, unfortunately this is one thing I do know something about, um, hopefully. Um, in terms of how this is going to work, I'm going to talk um, hopefully for about 40 minutes, um, but please feel free to interrupt me at any point if I'm speaking too quietly, which I may be, can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, or if you have any questions or, or anything I'm being very unclear about, because if you're wondering about something, then probably uh, someone else is too. Um, and then maybe we can have some questions uh, at the end if anyone has any general things they'd like to ask about. Um, before we talk about deputy leader speeches specifically, I'd like to say two things, um, which is that I think there's two elements to winning uh, debates. There's having very good ideas and being a clever person who knows about the world, um, and that in some ways is the easy bit, because you'll probably all have good ideas, know about the world, and kind of interesting people anyway, because you've chosen to do debating and spend a week of what could be your holidays uh, still in university rather than uh, doing whatever else you might want to do with your holidays. Um, and the more difficult bit is being disciplined about the way you present those ideas, which is to say, if you had an infinite amount of time, you could present every single argument and every single piece of rebuttal. And if you're a clever person with good ideas, you'd probably be able to win every single debate because of that. But what's unique about debating is you've only got seven minutes, which means you have to be very, very careful about what is the correct use of those seven minutes and making sure you're using them in the most effective and most strategic way, which I'm going to be talking about quite a lot because I think timing is something which people very, very often mess up. Um, I always get it wrong in each of my speeches. Um, and therefore, potentially, you lose debates not because you don't have the correct ideas, but because you don't realize what's most important or when um, to deploy them. Um, so in terms of deputy leaders' uh, speeches, I think they're unappreciated. I think um, when I used to do prime minister's speeches, I always saw the deputy leader's speeches as a kind of a thing which happened afterwards, which was less important, and just kind of followed up the leader's speech um, and regarded people who did them with, with like mild contempt. Um, which, obviously, they're less important than leader's speeches, but nevertheless, um, if the deputy leader's speech doesn't do the right bustle, if it doesn't present the right material, if it doesn't have the right uh, set of things in it, then you can lose the debate because you've made the wrong strategic choices. So knowing how to do them and how to make those trade-offs um, correctly is potentially the difference between winning uh, or losing um, a debate. Um, I think it's useful even if you're not doing deputy leaders because they present some interesting strategic scenarios and also uh, because you need to understand what your partner's going through when they're trying to prepare uh, deputy speeches. So in terms of, I think there are two main approaches to how to do uh, deputy leaders' speeches. The first one is to do a summary speech style speech, i.e. you explain what's happened previously in the debate and why your partner's already won it. So this sort of deputy leader speech, you concentrate mainly on rebuttal, on rebuilding your partner's points, um, and you don't have all that much new content. So it's, it's much more like a, a fourth speech for the, for the side of the house than it is like an extension speech or like a first speech. And I think this style of purely aggressive ex, uh, deputy speeches is becoming increasingly fashionable. More and more people are choosing not to present new material in their deputy speeches. So that's one potential way um, to do it. And sometimes people pretend they have new material, but actually they've just got rebuttal labeled as new material, um, which is fair enough, but kind of sneaky. Secondly, um, they could do an extension speech style of deputy uh, leader speeches, which is where you have some rebuttal at the beginning for maybe three minutes or so, but then you go on to present a whole range of new material in, say, the next four minutes of your speech. So it's more like an extension speech where you're adding a new substantive argument to the debate and you're trying to win it individually on the basis of a substantive um, contribution. And there are obviously degrees between these two speeches. You can choose to talk to varying extents about material or about rebuttal, um, material being substantive new arguments which aren't just responsive. Um, but I think those are the two categories into which these deputy leader speeches broadly fall, in which you've got to choose between um, what, what you want to be doing. And I think both those approaches have huge potential um, risks. You need to think very carefully about which approach you want to take. If you take the approach of doing merely a summary speech, i.e. just rebuttal and explaining why your partner's already won, 
The risk is that you beat the team immediately opposite you. So you beat the opening opposition or you beat the opening government. But at the same time, you're then beaten by the teams who come after you because you've left a lot of material on the table or because you're only countering the, two, the team you're directly opposite. So there's the potential, I think, for that to be quite a high-risk strategy where you're um, at danger of being... Um, you're at danger of losing to the team who's come after you because you haven't taken the opportunity to add new material to the table. Um, the second approach in terms of extension speeches, I think the risk is that you're being insufficiently responsive. I.e., there's a speech which has just come before you, or if you're in opposition, two speeches just have, which have just come before you, which have tried to destroy your partner's material. And if you're presenting a lot of new material, which is by necessity less important because you chose not to put it in the first speech, you're spending less time defending your partner's material and less time defending the material which could potentially win you the debate and which is going to have a greater impact on the outcome of the debate overall. So I think those are the two approaches to deputy leader, leader speeches or to, on both the opposition to the proposition and the various risks um, that they entail. I'm going to talk about, I think, um, four main things uh, in this uh, talk. Firstly, what you should never do in a deputy leader speech, regardless of what position you're in. Um, secondly, how to decide whether to give an extension type of deputy leader speech, i.e. a kind of third speech type of deputy leader speech, where you're a member of government, would like being member of government, and when to give a whip speech or a summary speech, um, like being the fourth speaker on your side. Um, uh, that's the second thing I'm going to talk about. Thirdly, going to talk about how to do rebuttal and rebuilding in a deputy, deputy leader speech. Um, and finally, going to talk about new substantive material um, and how to do that in deputy leader speech. And those are all going to be relevant also, I hope, for Prime Minister speeches, extension speeches, or other, any other speeches you want to make uh, in a debating context or outside of it. So, firstly, things not to do in a deputy leader speech. Do not try and win the debate by yourself, for yourself. The deputy leader speech, you are presenting material which is subordinate, and you have to work to support your partner's material. Your material is, almost by definition, less important than the material your partner has just presented, which means... If you want to win, you have to focus on rebuilding that material and making sure that material wins the debate, rather than running off in your own direction and attempting to win the debate on your own behalf by presenting a new set of arguments and ignoring that your partner's gone before you. So you should see yourself as to a significant extent a supporting act and try and support the arguments your partner's put forward. And that also means that if in prep time you think of an argument you think is very, very important, you should give it to your partner rather than trying to present it yourself. Um, because much as it is fun to outspeak your partner and be higher on the speaker tab than your partner, it's more fun to win the debate, um, and you'll get higher speaks overall if you work better as a team and you make sure that the most important points are in your first speech. Um, secondly, um, in prep time, you should also focus largely on your partner's material. I, you've got much more time prepared than your partner. You've got 14 minutes more, regardless of whether you're on opposition or you're on proposition, i.e. the entire length of prep time. Your partner, if they're on proposition, has only the prep time, and if they're on opposition, has the prep time plus seven minutes in which they've got to be writing responses. So they need much, much more help in terms of writing their material very, very fast in prep time, coming up with good arguments quickly. And if you come up with analysis, you should give it to them. And if they demand you come up with analysis, you should help them in prep time rather than working on your own speech, because you could work on your own speech during their speech, um, which you don't have to listen to so much because you know what's going to be in it. Um, finally, on this, you should never fail to be responsive. I, you are the only person in your team on government who has an opportunity to respond at all. The Prime Minister has no capacity to respond. That means that if you as the Deputy Prime Minister don't spend three minutes doing good responses and make sure that you're engaging um, with the debate, your team will be accused of non-responsivity and not engaging and you'll be very likely to lose the debate. So it's overwhelmingly important that you do good responses to the team opposite you and the same applies to a significant extent on Deputy Leader Opposition um, because the uh, leader opposition, they've only just heard the other side's case and they maybe don't have time to think of good responses. You're the only one who has the opportunity to present a reasonably considered response which is carefully thought through um, and explain why the other side's um, wrong. So three things you should uh, never do. You should, you should never focus purely on your own material. You should never focus on yourself in prep time and you should never fail to respond. If you do any of those three things, that means that your, your deputy leader speech or your, uh, on opposition or proposition is likely to result in your team uh, losing the debate. 
And I think it's very easy to think that you have a huge new argument and therefore you're not going to focus on your partner's material, or you have a huge new argument and therefore you're not going to be very responsive, but you have to focus on your strategic role as opposed to making your speech personally um, very exciting. Um, second thing is how to choose which type of deputy leader speech you're going to give. So as I said previously, two quite different types of deputy leader speech in terms of how much new material you're presenting or how much you're choosing to focus on rebuttal. Um, there's no right or wrong way of doing a deputy leader speech, but different debates will ask for different things. So you should think carefully about what sort of speech you want to give in the strategic context of the debate, how much rebuttal you think you need to give versus how much new content and new arguments you think you want to give. So you want to give um, an extension heavy speech with lots of new material. Um, if you think there's a strong team after you and you want to deny them of new arguments to say in their extension. So obviously as an opening team, your ideal scenario is the team who comes after you has very, very little to say. Um, so if you have a very extensive set of arguments in your second speech, it's overwhelmingly likely they'll have, very, they'll have less to say or they'll just be repeating your arguments and explaining why you won the debate. Um, so therefore, if you think the team who comes after you is quite good, then you might want to present a lot of new arguments. Um, secondly, if you think the debate is very, uh, there's a lot of arguments in it, you also want to present a lot of new arguments to deprive them of having uh, things to say and to make sure that you're taking all the best arguments for yourself. Or alternatively, if, if you think your partner has just focused on one material, maybe they mistimed their speech, maybe they're not very good, um, you might want to be presenting more material in your deputy speech, spending, say, four or five minutes on new material um, rather than on um, rebuttal. But alternatively, you might want to give a more attacking speech if you think the best team in the debate is the team immediately opposite you. I, if you're opening government and you think opening opposition is the best team in the debate, you should spend more time attacking them than you do on giving new material. Um, the reason being that they're your main competition, and what matters is directly beating them rather than the team, depriving the team who's behind you of things um, to say. So whether you choose to say new arguments or whether you choose to present largely rebuttal is determined by your reading of what type of motion it is firstly, and secondly, how good the teams are in the room are. Obviously, you don't always know how good the teams in the room are, but you'll often have some sort of impression of having to base against them before, and you should think about that in terms of your um, strategic knowledge um, and what you want to use. Um, I think on opposition, it's more likely that you're going to want to present a largely, um, you're going to want to present a largely um, new material-based speech because on proposition, you are the only speaker who is able to do any rebuttal at all, and therefore you want to do more rebuttal and less new material. Uh, on opposition, your partner also has the opportunity to do rebuttal, and therefore you should do um, more, you should do more uh, new material and less rebuttal. Um, I think time, thinking about the timings of how much of the type of material you do in a debate seems potentially quite boring, but I think it's very important um, because as a strategic choice, you've only got a very limited amount of time in your speech and what you choose to do with it determines whether you win or lose um, because ultimately it's just about whether you beat which of the teams in the debate you're deemed to be above by the judge rather than just how holistically good you are or like how good your argumentation is. It's whether you're seen as having beaten um, the other teams um, in this debate. Um, so having decided how much of a certain type of material you want to present, I think you need to think carefully about how you're going to stick to that time allocation. I, I think it's very common in a deputy leader speech to decide you're just going to give four minutes of new rebuttal and then you run away with yourself and by the end uh, it's six minutes in or five minutes in before you're giving yourself uh, any new material in your speech um, and you've, you're, you've spent far too long on rebuttal and your speech has become very mistimed and uh, misordered. I think there's... Um, Essentially, two things you should do um, to decide to make sure that you time your speech correctly and you're not wasting your time in your speech. The first one is that note that good timing is not something you do in your speech itself. It's something you do in prep time or when you're listening to the speeches which have gone um, before you. I, you've got to decide what's unnecessary and what's important before. Because if you're deciding during your speech what's important, you're, you're a bit confused, you're making a speech it's highly likely you're going to be unable to differentiate between what's most important. You'll just say whatever's written first on your paper rather than saying whatever's most important for winning you um, the debate. By contrast, when you're before, you can think about more carefully um, what, what's most important, what's strategically going to win you the debate, and therefore you can decide for yourself um, You can decide for yourself beforehand what you want to focus on, 
And therefore, if you find yourself running short of time during your speech, you can be careful to present the most important things and leave out those which are less important. Um, secondly, I think um, making notes which are clear and not just a jumble of everything you've written down during the previous speakers' um, speeches. So I've got very bad handwriting. I like to write down a lot of things. My notes are often very unclear. What that means is you just have a whole lot of things on your pieces of paper, and it's very difficult to tell what is or isn't important. It's very difficult to differentiate between what you do and don't want to say. You end up saying random stuff, which is not important, whilst leaving out most important rebuttals. And then afterwards, the judge says, look, you failed to rebut this argument, and therefore you lost the debate. But you're thinking in your head, I had the rebuttal written down on my piece of paper. I just forgot to say it, or I didn't have time to say it. I think that's the most frustrating position you're ever in, when you knew how to beat the other side's argument, but you just didn't get round to say it. I mean, the, the way to successfully never be in that situation again is firstly, as I said, to think carefully about what's important before you stand up rather than trying to prioritise when you're speaking. But secondly, to have notes which are reasonably clear and reflect what you want to say. How do you make notes which are clear? I think it's difficult and it works differently um, for other people, but there's three things um, you can protect, three things you, you should probably do. Firstly, you could think about having one set of notes on which you write down what the other side is saying, and one set of notes on which you write down responses. I, you have an initial set where you write down quickly, they said this argument, I think our responses should be this. And then you have a second set where you write down a more detailed set of what you think your responses should be, more carefully thought through, easier to follow, concise, and easy to read. That obviously takes time, and time is limited when you're an opening half and you're an opening half team, but I think it allows you to see more clearly what's in your um, speech and not just have a whole load of random stuff you've written down, a whole load of random arguments, and allows you to prioritise more clearly. The second one is to be very, very conscious when you're writing your notes that you're creating something you're going to be giving a speech from, which has to be clear, and that you're not going to remember later. I often think, or people often think, that they're going to be able to remember exactly what they meant by some kind of vague scrawl, which they wrote in a great hurry. Um, but normally, unless you're very, very excited by the debate, or you really love the topic, you're just going to forget what that means, and you're going to stumble over it. So you have to remember when you're making your notes that you're not just trying to create, like, write as much stuff down as fast as possible. You are creating a working record from which you're going to have to speak, and therefore you should focus on clarity. I think the final thing is, keep your notes and look over them afterwards. Think about what you did say in them and what you didn't say in them, and remember that your notes matter. I think we usually overlook in debates, and we think of it as just like a speech in which you say particular things, um, but notes can be incredibly important. You need to therefore think about them afterwards and talk through what you could be doing differently in your notes, rather than thinking of them as an individual, as like an entirely separate um, thing. I think the broader point here is that everyone always messes up timing and then goes, oh, I messed up my timing. Uh, never mind, wasn't actually I had bad material, I deserved to have won that debate. Um, I think timing is something you need to think about, because if you mess up your timing, it means you don't get the most important argument out, it means you don't get the most important rebuttal out, it means you don't hit the correct things, and it means you have all the right ideas in the debate, but you just lack the self-discipline um, to win it. And it's a deeply sad and distressing situation in which to find yourself, where you think you're the cleverest person in the room, or you think everyone else presented stupid arguments, but you just didn't get around to rebutting them because you had too many ideas and they were all written down hastily. So, like, don't be fooled by your own cleverness into having too much to say. Think, especially in a deputy leader or opposition speech, where you've got both rebuttal and, summer, and uh, new material, very carefully about what you want to say, why you want to say it, when you're going to say it, and how you're going to time your speech in advance. I think it's difficult, but it rewards thinking about very carefully. Um, thirdly, in terms of the broader area of um, rebuttal uh, and rebuilding. So rebuttal, I guess, is when you attack the other side's material. Rebuilding is when you rebuild the point that your partner in the first speech has offered uh, before you. The distinction between those two is obviously pretty arbitrary, because your partner's material attacks them, and they attack your partner's material, so rebuilding your partner is kind of similar to rebutting um, your opponent, but it's worth thinking explicitly not just about rebuttal, but also about rebuilding what's gone before to make sure that you're defending um, your partner from attacks. I think a couple of notes on rebuttal which people um, often or usually do wrong in terms of not rebutting things correctly. First thing to note is you can't rebut the other side's argument if you don't listen to it. Normally, you listen to the headline of the other side's argument. You go, ah, oh, I know what that's going to be. Okay, a bit boring. Let's write my speech now. Let's make good POIs. Um, or let's just kind of zone out, um, Facebook my friend, um, etc. Um, which, if you think the other side is not particularly good, which usually you won't, 
um, is the obvious attitude to take, but what it means is that you're not listening to the actual analysis they're presenting. And often, their argument will turn out to be quite different from what you thought it would be, what you expected them to say in prep, or you'll miss bits of their analysis, which will mean you're not responding to them properly. You'll sometimes be able to trick judges into thinking you've responded. Um, good for you, tricking judges is fun. Um, however, um, sometimes, though not always, the judges will be switched on and actually listening to the debate, which is, I, I guess, rarer than you'd hope it would be, um, but does sometimes happen. Um, and happens often enough that you need to prepare for the eventuality that the judge is actually listening to the other side's argument as it comes out. That means you have to respond to the it, it as it comes out, which means you actually have to know um, what it is. Secondly, having listened to the other side's argument, you've then got to try and be fair to it. So be fair to the argument as they actually said it, rather than like straw manning it, uh, and, and like pretending it was really bad and then attacking the worst possible version of the argument you can think of. If you just attack the worst possible version of the argument you can think of in an opening, the risk is the closing team's a bit better, and they've thought of some new ways of making the argument better. Or alternatively, the judge just quite likes that argument, quite likes that team, isn't listening very carefully, thinks they made it slightly better than you did, and they go, ah, oh, but you, you only responded to a bad version of their argument, they made it quite well, and therefore they defeat you. So whilst making fun of someone else's argument and saying this is ridiculous it is kind of a good, fun way to spend 30 seconds, um, in terms of winning the debate, um, and therefore ultimately having a nice day where you don't take thirds, um, it's a bad use of your time, and it's going to leave you being accused by judges of being insufficiently responsive or not responding correctly to the other side's argument. So make sure you're fair to that. For many people, that means you've got to write down the other side's arguments so you remember what they are, rather than just like trusting your head to remember them, because in a debate it's quite hot, there's lots of things to remember, you're thinking about your own argumentation, you'll just forget what the other side said and leave off some of their arguments, or leave off the ones to which you don't have such a good rebuttal. Um, which leads to the judge saying, oh, you didn't rebut this, therefore they must have beaten you. Um, so be careful to listen, listen fully to what the other side um, is saying. Also, in a deputy of opposition speech, be very aware of what your partner has already hit. I think the temptation is to repeat your partner's responses already. The reason being, you know what your partner's responses were, they're probably quite good. Your partner probably rebutted the worst arguments. So you can have a, a kind of fun and rhetorically pleasing time repeating your partner's responses emphasizing how clever your team was, but it doesn't strategically advance you. You're wasting time because the judge, if they're any good, has already written down your partner's responses and you don't need to repeat them. So maybe refer back to your partner's responses, but make sure that you're also um, making new ones and not just repeating things your partner's already hit. Um, fourthly, um, in terms of making rebuttal more compelling, look, we spend our, I spend my whole time debating. So I like to pretend that debating is an intellectually rigorous activity um, whereby people like think about things in a deep way and exchange arguments in a deep way. Unfortunately, this is a lie. Um, debating is, in many ways, deeply superficial. You've only got seven minutes, so you're pretending to know much more about a topic than you do. You're pretending to be much more sure about something than you do, and you have to sound much more knowledgeable and much more grown up and much more intellectually rigorous than you actually are. Um, the result of that is that whether a rebuttal is good is very much whether you can make a rebuttal sound good, um, which is about the way you present it, about as, uh, the same amount as what you say. Obviously, if you're saying something stupid, it's difficult to make it sound good, but you can make something mediocre sound great by the way you present it. If you present it really confidently, if you use lots of examples. I think when teams start off debating, or they're relatively new, and they go to debating competitions with more experienced teams, they hear the other side saying something really confidently, and they think, ah, oh, they must have read lots of academic papers on this. They must really know about this. Whilst, in fact, the other side is just making it up. Um, I think it does a rebuttal. The trick is just to make up the opposite of what they're saying. Um, they're lying. You should lie too. You just have to find ways to lie more compellingly. Uh, how do you lie more compellingly? You use more examples than the other side, or you give more reasons. Um, just counter-asserting this is untrue is not useful, because like the judge says, well, they said this, they said this, eh, I'll make up my own mind, um, and, and then given most judges are pretty bad, who knows what they'll do. Um, but if what you want to do is win the debate, you need to give the judge many reasons for coming down on your own side. So if you say, look, they said this, you three or four reasons we think our alternative version of reality is more true. Crucially, you pick the reasons after you've picked the alternative version of reality. 
So you don't go, I got reasons for thinking this is true. I will say this. That would be a reasonable thing to say. You say, this is the most strategically convenient thing for me to say, which will win me the debate. How can I justify that being true? So it's not about presenting a <coughs> fair case which accurately reflects why they might be wrong. It's about presenting what is most useful for you and coming up with a range of clever reasons why it might be true. Um, obviously, I'm exaggerating somewhat. You don't want to say something like completely irrational, which would just be strategically useful for you. But teams very often get away with saying things which are crazy in the real world, but which they justify very elegantly in a debate. And the judge goes, oh, that was well analyzed. Um, I'll give it to you over them. So don't be cowed off rebutting something just because you think it's untrue or implausible. Say whatever's helpful for you, uh, because winning the debate is more important than being a good person. Um, um, in terms of um, final things um, on rebuttal, um, hitting the premise. You can spend a long time going through like the five or six layers of analysis they offered behind um, an argument. But most arguments like, um, I hope it's the right pen, have a certain structure, right? So it's like a tree. Um, so there's all these points of analysis coming off it, um, which are kind of uh, the kind of the, the branches or the leaves on the argument, but they are dependent on an underlying premise, which is to say, if my argument is that um, such and such an education policy will cause more economic growth in the country, and this will cause people to like get richer, as a result, women will be more empowered and ethnic minorities will be treated better. The stuff about people being, uh, women being more empowered, people getting richer and having better lives, ethnic minorities being treated better, is all premised on the idea that the education system is better or the economy is better. So you in your speech, as I said, you've got a limited amount of time. So you can decide, do you want to spend your two minutes going through each of these things and kind of attacking all of them, sort of, but rushing on to the next one, and then maybe forgetting to rebut number three because you've got to move on quickly, which realistically is what happens because most people miss time most of the time. Or do you choose to attack the premise of your speech and then point out that the premise of the other side's argument, then point out that absolutely everything else they say is contingent on the premise, which is to say, if the trunk of the tree is cut off, all this stuff goes away. Um, so you don't need to spend two minutes going through all this stuff. You need to spend one minute or two minutes just cutting this off thoroughly and then remind the judge that everything else falls as a result of this. Um, so there are different ways of choosing to rebut an argument, some of which are much faster than others. When you have to rebut lots of arguments in a limited amount of time, you should identify what the underlying premise of the other side's speech is and go for that, rather than going through each individual layer of analysis and like hitting them all individually. Because if you do that, you run out of time and you'll probably lose, uh, which is sad. Uh, uh, I think the other thing to do is, in a reasonably good debate, there are going to be a lot of claims traded. You will, if your opponents are quite bad, maybe be able to demolish all of their claims, say they're stupid, convince the judge they deserve 71s, etc. Um, however, that won't happen all of the time, because sometimes, unfortunately, your opponents will be competent. Um, the result of this is that you need to explain why, even if their arguments are true to some extent, they're less important than yours. So, for example, if you were the team who was arguing this new education system would make people richer and happier and there would be better outcomes for everyone in the country, and your opposition team argued convincingly that this education system would also like, make children uh, sadder, give them a worse childhood because they'd have to do more homework, etc., um, maybe both these claims are true, right? Neither of them is going to be completely disproved, um, and both of them will stand to some extent. And the judge is going to sit in their um, kind of judgment booth in their 15 minutes, Desperately trying to come up with a rationalization for why they can give one team over the other. Um, you can let the team judge come up with the reason why two sta one of two standing arguments is more important than the other themselves. Um, sometimes they'll do a good job, sometimes they'll come down on your side, sometimes they won't. But if you want to win, what you should do is provide them with your own reason why your argument is more important than the other side's. I, even if both arguments stand, ours is better. Um, so having cut down the other side's like argument tree and explained why its premises and analysis falls and they can't win off the basis of it, you should then say, look, even if this argument still works, okay, here's why this argument is relatively unimportant, and even if for some reason you as a judge are convinced by it, and you think both arguments are still standing, you should come down on our side.
which means when the judge is going through their notes very quickly after the debate and trying to come up with a call as fast as possible, they go, ah, oh, there are two arguments standing. But there's a nice piece of reasoning I can say in my adjudication as to why one argument is more important than the other. Um, and realistically, judges tend to say the easiest thing available to them um, because they've got very, very little time to make a decision. So if you give them a ready-made reason to give you the win, they will give you the win. Make judges' lives easy for them. They will love you. They don't want to be doing hard work. They probably don't want to be there at all. They may be doing this as a favor for a friend. Um, so just like pamper them, um, explain clearly why your argument is more important, um, why you've demolished their premises. Don't make them do any hard work in terms of your rebuttal. Um, and they'll give you 80s um, and, and chat with you at the social afterwards and you'll be happy. Um, in terms of uh, rebuilding, which is, I guess, uh, quite very like rebuttal, as I said earlier, the first thing to do is be critical of your partner. Um, I, I'm sure you're very nice people. You listen to your partner's speech, you think, ah, oh, they've done a good job today, I'm very happy with this speech. Um, or alternatively, um, you, you just kind of think, oh yeah, we've run our material fairly well, that's fine. I don't think that's what you should be doing. You should be listening to your partner's speech the same way the judge is, or the same way the opposition speaker is. I, how have they messed up today? What have they done wrong? What could I do better? Um, and then think about all the things you can change in their speech. Because realistically, your partner's probably quite good. Um, but unless they're like one of a very small number of people, uh, and they're like kind of an MP or something, it's unlikely that they haven't made any mistakes in their speech or they haven't left any analysis. Because they've only got 15 minutes, um, and we're all human, and therefore we all make mistakes in our speeches. Um, therefore, you should think about your partner's speech as a series of potential disasters. Um, where the judge might say you lost for this reason. So listen to this analysis, listen to your partner's analysis and think, ah, that's a bit weak, we could lose, and the judge would say we lose because of that. Listen to your partner's impact in an explanation of why your partner's material is the most important, and think, ah, oh, we could lose because of that. So your partner's speech is not just a series of strengths, it's a series of liabilities which could cause you to lose. Um, and the result of that is that you need to listen to what those liabilities are and correct them in your speech. So, if in your partner's speech, they did not explain why their material was the most important impact in the debate, explain it in yours. If they did not explain why some bit of their argument followed or it was like incomplete, explain it in yours. Help your partner out by being critical of them, and you're much more likely to win rounds. Uh, I think um, the other co the other consequence this is like this is true in all positions, especially true in definitely your own position, because. Even if your partner's flaws haven't been pointed out yet, they could well be pointed out by a closing team, um, and then you'll lose, uh, and that will be uh, ruin your whole week. Um, in terms of other things you do, in terms of rebuilding your partner's material, secondly, I think explain why it's important. So, when a judge says you've lost a debate, the trendy and easy thing for the judge to say is you did not impact well enough your explanations as to why your material was the most important are not good enough. I say this almost every time I give a fourth or a third, largely for two reasons. Firstly, often it's true. And secondly, because you know, you've got this angry team in front of you and you've got to say something. Um, and it sounds plausible and it applies to most scenarios. Um, so do not give the judge that easy excuse to give you the fourth or not deny you that first. Make it very, very clear why your material is overwhelmingly important. There's just a couple of set ways you can do that. There's basically two things you can do. The first one is, the group of people this affects are numerous. Um, there are several billion of them, therefore they're more important than the other sides of people of whom there's only several thousand. It's pretty intuitive, it takes 10 seconds to say, um, and judges will usually give you the win on, on the basis of it. The second thing you can do is, look, there's not that many of our group, but they are uniquely important. They're having a terrible time, they're very poor, they're very persecuted, we owe them something for some reason, or they're otherwise very important. So I think those are the two utilitarian, i.e. kind of outcome-based ways of explaining why your argumentation is the most important. The final thing you can do to explain why your partner's argumentation was the most important is why it's principally the most important. I, even if the outcomes aren't better, we have a duty to do this because we have such a strong moral obligation. Um, and if we don't do this, then we'll be like horrifically immoral uh, and we'll be bad people. I would be wary of doing principled argumentation because most of us tend to think most of the time about what happens to people and what the utilitarian outcomes are. So if the other side is explained in a utilitarian, i.e. people-based perspective, 
of why their arguments are the most important. Don't just do principles. Present at least some stuff about the numbers, about how the groups are the most vulnerable on your side as well. Um, you can choose which one of those you use, but you've got to use one of them. Uh, because you need to explain not only why your argument's true, but also why it's relevant. Because you've got the best analyzed, the most fantastically presented argument in the world. Uh, but if the judge doesn't believe it's important in the debate, you still can't win. The judge could be convinced you were the cleverest person in the room, the one they'd most like to employ, um, but nonetheless, they can have to give you a lower score because they were unable to believe your argument was more important than other teams in the debate. Don't put them in that difficult position. Explain why your argument is so important, and there's just a number of um, cookie-cutter reasons you can use, or you can come up with your own reasoning for why it's more important. If your partner hasn't done that, do that in deputy. Finally, don't make too many concessions. Um, the, the opposition come out, or the other team come out, and they attack your speech very vehemently. They seem very, very sure. If it's a subject about which you don't know much, the temptation is going to be just say, ah, oh, yeah, that might be sort of true, but our argument still stands to some extent. Because it's very difficult, and we don't normally do it in real life, to stand up to someone and say, no, you're completely wrong, I'm completely right, I completely disagree, because it feels rude, and it's not what we're like, programmed to do and brought up to do. So most people will want to make like some partial concession, say, like, let's meet you halfway. If you try and meet the other team halfway, and they stay stuck in their position, you lose. Um, think of it as like a, a kind of a, a battlefield, whereby if you uh, give the other team more territory, and they take that, even if you're still holding some of your territory at the end of the battle, they still won. So don't make unnecessary concessions and be very wary about conceding that anything they say at all is true. Especially because even if a concession doesn't mean you've lost, judge will often think it means you've lost. Remember that judging is very impressionistic. The judge is listening, like listening to your speech kind of vaguely, and they get an impression of, are oh, they seem to be saying that a lot of things the other side was saying is, are true, or that a lot of the attacks the other side made were valid, which gives you the impression of being weak and the other side the impression of being strong. Do not allow that impression to be given off because it will put you in weaker positions and it will not place you well um, in the debate. So that is broadly how to rebuild your partner's extension um, from attacks. The most important way to, your partner's material from attacks, the most important way to do that, I think, is to be aware of what those attacks were. So again, write them down very carefully and make sure you've responded to each one, even if you think it's stupid. Because you might think it's stupid, but someone else might not, and therefore just explain why it's stupid in 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And don't be kicking yourself later when a stupid reason becomes the reason you lost the debate. Um, in terms of final area, in terms of new content, so I talked briefly earlier about the reasons why you might want to be running new content, why you might want to be running new content. I, so you want to deprive the other side of the, the team who comes after you of new things to say, because if they've got nothing to say, they probably lose. The most often reason that closing teams lose is because they have no new material. So don't give them any new material and they'll lose and you're guaranteed to place above one team um, in the room. <clears throat> Way to make sure that you don't give them new material is to think of the stakeholders, the groups of people they're likely to think about, and run points about that. So, in an extension, people like running points about minorities or like running points about the effects on a particular social group. In your second speech, run a point in that so about that social group. If your partner hasn't run a point about principles, in your second speech, run a point about principles. Um, just make sure that you've covered all the ground if you think the team who's coming after you is broadly uh, competent. And then you won't have the, the sadness of, of hearing that argument, thinking, oh, I could have said that, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to or I didn't have time. Um, you don't have to say it well, you just have to say it to the extent that you can be credited with it and the judge can know that it's to some extent new. Because even if you haven't explained all the analysis, having their extension only partially new is better for you than having it entirely new and makes you place much better um, in the round. So I think there's two other reasons that you might want to be running argumentation. The first is that they're high impact arguments in their own right. I, you can explain why you win the debate in their own right on the basis of them. I think it's fairly self-explanatory why you would want to be uh, running that sort of argument in the debate and why that would be something um, you want to, uh, why that would be something you would want to be running. It's just like any other speech, um, high impact argument where you can explain that this is the most important group, therefore uh, we win. The final one is, I think, arguments to muddy the water about who wins on which particular group. What I mean by that is, 
When you go into a debate, there are normally certain issues you expect one side to talk about and one side to win on and one side to lose on. Um, and that means that you tend not to make arguments about the other side's key group because you think, oh, that's their space, we'll talk about our group, and then you end up trying to weigh off two different things. So you end up trying to weigh off equality versus economic growth, or you end up trying to weigh off like uh, backlash versus progress, or things like that. If you, in your second speech, can make an argument about why actually the other side's argument works for your side, even if you don't win that argument, even if it isn't that well presented and the judge goes, that's a bit unusual, um, you've still entered into their territory and you've created complexity about whether they've won on their key issue, um, which means you have to win on your key issue less thoroughly to win the debate. Um, because let's say there are two competing uh, ideas of what's most important. If you have 100% of one and 50% of the other, you definitely win. If you, only ha if you have 100% of one and the other side has 100% of the other, then like, it's unclear who wins. So make bold attacks into the other side's material. Think about what they're likely to run in their case and make a case about that for yourself in your deputy leader's speech. Or alternatively, just listen to what they're running in their own speeches and make a case about them that, that in their deputy leader's, leader's speech. Um, so four areas there to think about in deputy leader's speeches. Firstly, in terms of um, what never to do. Secondly, in terms of how to time your speeches correctly so you don't end up just not saying your best responses and losing out to worse teams who are just more disciplined than you without being as clever. Um, and finally, uh, fi uh, thirdly, how to rebut and uh, think about rebuilding. And finally, in terms of new argumentation. So do you want to have any questions uh, on that or is everyone exhausted? Mm. Trending towards exhaustion. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions um, or things they'd like to talk about, please approach me afterwards. Uh, or if you thought they're ready now, please ask me now. Or ask anyone else. If anything was unclear, I'm very sorry, and please uh, come and ask me to clarify. Thank you very much.